These slides discuss spatial and environmental patterns in diversity and in origination, including large-scale features of global diversity, like the geographic distribution of living bivalve species shown here. So there's quite a lot of variability that you can see, but the most consistent trend, large-scale pattern, is that diversity decreases from the tropics near the equator towards the poles along every coastline. So we'll discuss that latitudinal diversity gradient first, and then consider how the origination and distribution of different clades relates to environment along a gradient from shallow to deep water. So a latitudinal diversity gradient, where a clade contains more species or genera, etc., um, near the equator and fewer at high latitudes, is a common feature of many, although not all, clades. So the example illustrated here from marine bivalves shows their diversity along the world's coastlines, and all of them have this typical latitudinal diversity gradient that peaks near, although not exactly, at the equator. So why do these latitudinal diversity gradients exist at all? Why are there more species near the equator than near the poles? Well, we'll see what the uh, fossil record tells us, at least for this example of marine bivalves. Two types of explanations have been proposed to account for these diversity gradients. One argues that the tropics contain more species because origination rates are higher there than they are outside of the tropics. That's been termed the tropics as a cradle model because birth rates or origination rates are, are responsible. The alternative is that origination rates are relatively constant in all regions, but that taxa are more likely to go extinct outside of the tropics. So that explanation would consider the tropics as a museum, because lower extinction in the tropics would tend to preserve taxa there for longer geological time durations, kind of like preserving old things in a museum. So how can the fossil record test these ideas? Well, here's some, some data. Many of the living bivalve genera, at least those that we can see that evolved in the last 10 million years or so, have their first record in tropical localities. So in the Pleistocene, the Pliocene, and the late Miocene, origination in the tropics outnumber or greatly outnumber those in the extra tropics. Those are the, the left-hand column of, of boxes there. So that piece of evidence would tend to support the idea of the tropics as a cradle, and that the gradient may be um, caused by differences in origination. But this other data here suggests that it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. So even though many of these taxa, in fact, did first appear in the tropics, a lot of them now live both in the tropics and at higher latitudes. And that's shown in the histograms on the right, which show the greatest poleward latitude of the genera that originated in each of our three time periods. So for example, of the 25 genera that first appeared in the Pleistocene, this is the, the upper row in the right column, only five of them still occur just in the tropics, the, the left two bars of the histogram. And the other 20 have ranges that extend from the tropics to regions outside of there. One of them even ranges as far as 45 degrees north or south. The ages of bivalve genera also provide additional evidence. So on average, genera that live at the poles, like in the Arctic or the Antarctic, tend to have longer geological durations. On average, these Arctic genera have been around for 50 million years, compared to a duration of only 26 million years for the average tropical genus. But that difference actually suggests that extinction rates are lower at the poles, because the taxa have been around for a longer time. And that's actually the opposite of the prediction from either the tropics as a cradle or the tropics as a museum hypothesis. However, many of these very old genera, say the ones that occurred or first appeared 75, 100, 200 million years ago, occur not only at the poles, but also in the tropics. So altogether, the data suggests something like this, which has been called the out of the tropics model. There is strong evidence that, from the fossil record that taxa are actually more likely to originate in the tropics. So the tropics are a cradle of some sort. However, the extinction is a little bit more complicated. There are older taxa on average outside of the tropics, but there are actually very few old taxa uniquely found there. Many of these old taxa, or virtually all of these old taxa that you find outside of the tropics, first originated and also occur in the tropics. So it seems that, that extinction rates 
are actually higher outside of the tropics, but that's being offset by migration or immigration from the tropics. So most importantly, and this is really what is the key to this and how it differs from the other, other models, tropical taxa expand their ranges over time towards higher latitudes. So that explains both the modern distribution, where formerly tropical taxa now live both in the tropics and outside of the tropics, and it also explains why, on average, extratropical taxa are older, because there's a bit of a time lag between the time a clade originates and the time that it expands its range to the extratropical areas. So in addition to large-scale patterns at the latitudinal diversity gradient, diversity and origination can also vary across environmental gradients. The onshore, offshore, or bathymetric gradient from shallower to deeper water is a really important one and exerts a major influence on a lot of different biological processes. You've previously learned how marine invertebrates have these depth preferences and these depth tolerances, and how things like facies bias can affect recognition of first appearances because of those depth preferences. So remember that depth itself doesn't directly affect the organisms. And so there's a whole variety of fairly predictable depth-related trends in things like wave energy, or substrate quality, nutrient levels, and environmental stability in things like temperature or salinity, or the frequency of, of storms. So let's use the distribution of this crinoid group called Isocrinida as an example. The chart on the right is called a time environment diagram. It shows time as the vertical axis, in this case from the beginning of the Triassic at the bottom to the present day at the top, and it shows the onshore to offshore environmental spectrum as the horizontal axis from the shallowest water near shore on the right to the deeper water slope and basin on the left. Time environment diagram combinations or time environment combinations that contain fossils of these crinoids are shaded in black and the empty or the white boxes have no data at all. So because there are no fossils known, it's not really possible to know whether the crinoids would have lived there or whether they weren't there. The dotted boxes indicate that crinoids probably weren't present. Other fossils are known from those time environment combinations, but crinoids have never been found. So these isocrinids have this sort of history. They first appear in these onshore habitats in the Triassic, but don't seem to be present in deeper water environments. They expand to have a broad range of habitats, from shallow all the way to deep in the Jurassic. And they finally become restricted only to these offshore habitats. They're absent from shallower water environments in the later part of the Cretaceous and especially in the Cenozoic. So this type of onshore to offshore pattern seems to be pretty common among a variety of groups, but it raises a couple questions. These questions, I would emphasize, are still largely unanswered. Question one, why do higher level groups like orders or families originate more often in these onshore habitats? Well, higher level clades, like a family or an order, in theory should be characterized by more significant or greater evolutionary novelties. So perhaps those sort of novelties are more likely to occur for whatever reason in shallow water habitats. Alternatively, you might imagine that these sort of novelties can occur everywhere, but that origination rates are higher onshore, or there are just maybe more species living in these shallow water habitats to produce novelties. Kind of like the idea of a million monkeys typing away at keyboards to produce great literature. Second, why do the clades expand offshore? The newly evolved clade might, may in fact be a superior competitor, so Perhaps it can displace these older clades that were living offshore beforehand. But it's important to note, just like with evolutionary trends, these onshore clades can only expand in one direction. They're already starting in the shallowest possible habitat, so they can't get any shallower. So this could be, and it looks a lot like, a type of diffusion during a bounded random walk that you might remember from the evolutionary trends lecture. So finally, why does the clade disappear from shallower water? Well, in a more driven trend type hypothesis, you might imagine they could be displaced by a newly evolved shallow water clade. This is kind of the mirror image of the previous hypothesis. So maybe if we think that the clade expanded by displacing other clades, maybe it was then displaced by a later clade. 
So alternatively, there could be a more probabilistic type explanation. Conditions maybe are more stable offshore, so it's possible that speciation could be slightly more likely in that direction. Maybe it's easier to become thanatopic than it is to become uretopic. So I'll stress that there's really, um, these hypotheses all remain to be tested. There's not a lot of conclusive evidence to support any of these ideas. Um, however, these types of onshore-offshore patterns are prevalent enough that there may be some sort of underlying environmental driver. One possibility, for example, is that nutrient levels have increased over this interval and probably over the Phanerozoic as a whole. So clades that originated earlier on may have been adapted for these lower productivity type environments and therefore may have been displaced over time to live in lower productivity offshore habitats as the global productivity increased. As global productivity increased, maybe new taxa can evolve in shallow water to take advantage of that high productivity there. And the previous taxa that are really better adapted for these low productivity environments have to move offshore where the conditions remain having sort of low nutrient levels, lower productivity.